So, welcome to the 20, 38th Trends in the Real Estate Market Seminar. I'd like to all thank you all for coming here, but not only those of you here today, but those of you who have been here for many, many years. We, ta we take a bit of a chance having this event in mid-January, but the weather gods seem always to be kind to us with typically mild weather on the day of the event, and what could be a better day than today? But that's form rather than substance. We have had a great cross-section of keynote speakers over the years, from Ned Johnson, Chairman of Fidelity, to Chuck Fest, President of MIT, Tom Wolfe in the depths of the 90s real estate doldrums, and real estate icons such as Sam Zell, Gerald Hines, and Ed Lindy. Most recently, John Fish, Steve Wynn, and Governor Charlie Baker. We have a great keynote speaker today whom I will introduce a little bit later in the program. We have changed the format of the program today with Jim Elcock doing a market overview and then two panels, one on the capital markets headed by my co-chair Kevin Phelan and one on the office market chaired by John Carroll. You will hear from some of our market experts as to the current trends and projections for 2017. Stepping back, as we look at where we are today and where we are going, one cannot help but focus on the extraordinary changes taking place in this city and region. GE's arrival in Boston for its global headquarters, which was announced a year ago tomorrow uh, by Governor Baker and Mayor, Mayor Walsh, jointly in a profound, is a profound statement. For the 11th largest Fortune 500 company to relocate to, Bo relocate to Boston speaks volumes. The underlying reason for choosing Boston, as stated by G uh, GE CEO Jeff Immelt, is the intellectual capital and ecosystems of academia, healthcare, and research based in the Boston Cambridge area, and his vision and statement that there is no reason why Boston can't, over the next 20 years, be the leading center of technology and change that the Silicon Valley and Seattle have been for the last 20 years. Jeff Immelt not only wants to be part of that evolution, but he wants to help lead it. The access of MIT and Harvard underlying, and the underlying university structure, particularly in the research and hospital area and uh, bio uh, uh, fields, uh, those strengths separate us from most other cities and regions and gives us a strategic advantage for the future. As you know, we are heavily dependent on grants on the NIH with an annual run rate of two plus billion dollars a year. That's in the form of literally hundreds of multi-year grants with literally thousands of jobs. So that's a big underpinning of our economy. With a new administration coming into office in eight days, the world is watching to see what impact Trump's radical departure from the norm will, uh, in doing business will have in our economy. Wall Street Journal lead editorial today says it will be adventuresome and interesting. That's probably an understatement. So far, the results have been relatively positive with the stock market, uh, with a hit, hit yesterday, though, to the biotech stocks. But we're, over the next four years, uh, as I look at this, we're in the real estate business, not projection, projection in the economy and stocks, so it would be foolhardy at best to figure out where that's going. We control what we can control. We lay out uh, best plans and provide contingency plans for unseen events. As we know from past experience, recoveries take a long time to mature, but negative changes can happen very abruptly, such as the stock market crash in 87, the 9-11 attacks, and the crisis of 07-08 uh, and the financial worlds. Recovery has been strong since 2009, and thanks in part to low interest rates, the real estate industry has had a very strong run. Increasing interest rates will require increased cap rates, cap rates, but I'll leave that and the fine points of that to Kevin's Capital Markets panel. Along the theme of infrastructure and planning issues, the following is a brief video featuring infrastructure, development, and entrepreneurial and high-tech sectors uh, gentlemen uh, who are deeply involved in these issues. In the order of appearance, we have Brian Golden, director of the Boston and Planning Development Agency, Bruce Welty, co-founder, chairman of uh, Locus Robotics and Quiet Logistics, Tim Rowe, founder and CEO of Cambridge Innovation Center, Brian Dacey, president of the Cambridge Innovation Center, and Fred Salvucci, uh, Mr. Transportation, MIT, and father of the Big Dig, uh, along with uh, our own experts, uh, Jocelyn Guglia, Development Consulting Services, who will introduce uh, one of the speakers, Tim Brodekin, Suburban Brokerage, Dan Collins, Urban Brokerage, and Aaron Jodka, who is our Director of Research. So uh, I'd like to bring the program to the next level. 
with companies such as GE and Reebok announcing their move into an urban setting, there's something undeniable about the revitalizing energy and the attraction that Boston provides. It certainly compels our government to take a good look at how the city will ultimately sustain and support such rapid growth. Imagine Boston 2030 is the city's first comprehensive general plan since 1965. 50,000 new people have arrived in Boston in the past six years, and we know we need to do a lot of planning and, frankly, a lot of building to accommodate that new population. In general, I see a world where there's going to be large fulfillment centers in the middle of the country, just like there are today, but many satellite facilities closer to the population centers that will be automated with robots. The way we shop today has changed dramatically from just a few years ago. This is putting pressure on brick and mortar retail locations, but has provided a strong backbone for the industrial market. Bruce is at the forefront of the e-commerce revolution. I think one of the things people don't understand about this e-commerce revolution is what happened is we took these jobs that used to be done by the consumer. All that work now has to be done by companies like ours. So it's a new job. It has a new requirement. These jobs didn't exist before e-commerce came along. Using a robot takes all the things that we do that are inefficient and it reduces everything down to what I would call the theoretical shortest amount of time you can do those things. And I think we're approaching that with these robots, and that's pretty exciting. Predicting the future is never easy. Robotics are becoming a focal point of businesses far and wide. And Boston is well suited to benefit from this technological progress. We're building what we believe will be the best shared robotics development environment anywhere on the planet. We are seeing a future in which we'll be building specialized industry hubs like that for essentially every industry. We are fortunate to be in Greater Boston surrounded by world-class institutions. We have entrepreneurs and cutting-edge technology, but we need to keep our focus on the startup economy. There is new research that shows what happens to the rest of a place when it becomes a strong tech hub. What they're showing is that the wages of people who only have a high school degree are 45% higher in the tech hubs than they are in the non-tech hubs. And they're showing that for every new tech job that's created, you create five other jobs. In terms of what's needed is more support uh, for the infrastructure that we have. You've got to get transportation right. Uh, you've got to get housing costs down. And that's partly about better transportation in from the outer lying area. Transportation is on the mind of every investor, developer, and employer in commercial real estate. The MBTA you rode on 20 years ago and 30 years ago was far better than the MBTA you ride on today. There's a lot that needs to happen. It's not a big dig. It's a bunch of pieces which add up to a lot. Boston is not the only city dealing with urbanization, densification, and the strains that puts on public transportation infrastructure. We don't have to be original, we just have to copy London. I mean, they've been through a long period like us of disinvestment and lack of investment, and they finally said, if we're gonna grow, we gotta get serious. With an enormous pipeline and tremendous ongoing demand, it begs the question, how long can this pace continue? And might the city be anticipating any particular end goal? Leveraging new development to, to play a role in, in the creation of infrastructure that benefits not just the development, but the broader community. When the next downturn comes, the more quality development we have achieved, the better. We enter the next economic downturn, hopefully with the wind at our back. That's, thank you. Some wise sages in that group, uh, when you think of what Cambridge, the Cambridge Innovation Center has done in the last few years, it's astounding. From a, from a real small organization on their own, they now have over 300,000 feet between Boston and, and uh, Cambridge and uh, expanding overseas as well. I'd like to pause for a moment to recognize one of Collier's great professionals, Gentaro Sipas, also known as CHOPS. CHOPS retired December 31st after 53 years, eight months, and 29 days at Collier's and Meredith and Grew. Known to his uh, clients for his, for his diligence and, and flawless appraisal work, Chop set a very high barrier in working six days a week and was always willing to drop what he was working on, on to help a colleague. 
If you notice from the photograph, he had a blonde crew cut when he arrived, and he still has a blonde crew cut. A little sandy, but uh, dusty, but he's still, he's still got a full uh, head of hair and, and quite a guy. So please join me. Um, he will not be forgotten. Please give me a round of, give a round of applause for Chop Seekers. <laughs> <laughs>